Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, howdy. Hey, it's great to see you uh, today. My name is Timothy Atik. I'm the executive director of Breakaway Ministries in College Station, and I absolutely love any opportunity that I have to be here at FaithBridge. Uh, man, it's been such a joy to, to partner with FaithBridge, for Breakaway to partner with FaithBridge for a really long time. And so any chance I get to be with you is always a joy. Uh, I'll tell you this, as I was growing up, I was introduced to a comedian named George Carlin, and uh, that, might name, that name might sound familiar to some of you, and you didn't expect to hear that name in church this morning. <laughs> uh, but I'll tell you this, if you're not familiar with George Carlin, he is considered one of the most influential comedians of all times. He passed away back in 2008. And the reason that he was so influential is because he was really a revolutionary of his time. Uh, He was willing to say things that other people weren't willing to say. And so I wanna share with you this morning what George Carlin had to say about believing in God. And it has everything to do with what we're talking about this morning. Here's what George Carlin said. And just so you know, uh, the way that George Carlin said it, is not exactly gonna be the way that I say it. Uh, This is probably the more family-friendly version. But he said something like this. I want you to know, when it comes to believing in God, I really tried. I really, really tried. I tried to believe that there's a God who created each one of us in his own image and likeness, loves us very much, and keeps a close eye on things. I really tried to believe that, but I gotta tell you, the longer you live, the more you look around, the more you realize something is messed up. Something is wrong here. War, disease, death, destruction, hunger, filth, poverty, torture, crime, corruption, and the ice capades. Something is definitely wrong. He says, this is not good work. If this is the best God can do, I'm not impressed. Results like these do not belong in the resume of a supreme being. This is the kind of stuff you'd expect from an office temp with a bad attitude. And just between you and me, in any decently run universe, this guy would have been out on his all-powerful rear end a long time ago. That's what George Carlin has to say. And, and I think that, that that statement was just birthed out of this idea of looking out into the world and seeing what life is like in this world. And what I really appreciate that is that I believe that George Carlin is in a way articulating what many people really think and believe. It is really hard to reconcile this idea of a perfect God allowing evil and suffering in this world. I mean, I don't know if you know this, but to date in 2018, there have been over 115 mass shootings. Just in 2018, there's been over 700 terrorist attacks worldwide. And so how do you deal with that? How do you process through evil and suffering in this world in relationship to God? I think that you have four options. Here's your four options. The first option is that God doesn't exist. That's why God doesn't do anything about the evil and suffering, is he's not around to do anything about it. The second option is that God does exist And he could do something about it, he just chooses not to. So basically, he has the power, he just doesn't care, which makes him a monster. The third option is that God does exist and he really wants to do something, he just doesn't have the power to do it. So he's he's caring, he's just not powerful. The fourth option is that God does exist, God does care, God does have the power to do something. He has been doing something. He is doing something. And he will do something finally to deal 
with all evil and suffering. Those are your four options. And so let me just ask you, which one of those options best connects with where you're at in life right now and your convictions about God and then evil and suffering? I want you to know we're in a two-week series. We're beginning a two-week series this week that we are calling Tough Stuff. And so today, we're just gonna answer the question, what's up with God doing nothing about evil and suffering in the world? And then next week, so today is kind of looking outside of us, and next week is going to be about looking inside of us, and we're going to have a really honest conversation about the topic of suicide. And uh, my hope is that next week would breathe life into many of you who might be struggling. So come back for that next week. But in the meantime... This morning, I want to answer three questions, and here they are. The first question is this. Are evil and suffering arguments for or against the existence of God? That's the first question. The second question is, are evil and suffering arguments for or against the goodness of God? And then the third question is, are evil and suffering arguments for or against the power of God? So let's just navigate our way through those. And hopefully it will help you figure out where you really stand on this idea of God and evil and suffering. The first question is, are evil and suffering arguments for or against the existence of God? Well, I think that um, one of the most famous authors from the 20th century, C.S. Lewis, is really gonna send us down the right path. I don't know if you know this, but C.S. Lewis was an atheist for a good amount of time, specifically because of the evil and suffering that he looked at in the world. But he came to a point in his wrestling where he realized that evil and suffering actually present a bigger problem for atheism than they do for Theism, listen to what he says. He says this, as an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust, but how had I got this idea of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some ideas of a straight line. What was I comparing this universe with when I called it unjust? So just think about it, objective evil presupposes objective good, and objective good presupposes a standard that is outside of ourselves which determines what is actually objectively right in this world. Let me kind of position a different way for you. How would you define evil? Just think about that. Just pop quiz, how would you define evil? Let me tell you my definition. This is not a Christian definition. I didn't get this from a Christian resource. I didn't, this is, this is just what I believe, a no-nonsense, very clear, concise definition of evil. Evil is simply that which should not be. That's it, that's evil. That which should not be. Well, just think about that definition. If evil is that which should not be, that definition assumes that there's a way in this world that things should be. It assumes that we have some understanding of how life in this world should be. And I think that we get that. I think that that, all, that makes sense to us. That's, that's why we all can have the same reaction to devastation in our world. That's why when certain things come on the news. When we see 9-11 or we hear about the Holocaust or we see the the shootings in Vegas or the attacks in London or Paris, when we see these things, we are able to look at them and say, that's not right. It is never okay for someone to step onto a college campus and to take innocent lives. That's why we can agree on that because we are all appealing to a standard that is outside of ourselves, which is in some way objective. It, it declares what should be in this world. Now, when we're talking about this idea of, of evil and the existence of God, it's very important for us to have a conversation about worldview. What you need to know is you have a 
worldview. Every single person in this world has a unique but specific worldview. You need to know your worldview is the lens through which you make sense of human experience, okay? Your worldview, it's a framework or it's a network of core convictions which help you answer the big questions in life and make sense of human experience. And your worldview has been shaped over years by your upbringing, by your education, by your experience in life. What you have to determine is, does your worldview, does the lens through which you see life actually make the most sense of human experience? What I'm saying is you have to determine if the lens through which you're seeing life is actually a good lens. Because if it's not, you might need to trade it out for a different one. But does your worldview make the best sense of human experience? Let me me kind of unpack what I'm saying this way, okay? On September 11th, 2001, I was a junior at Texas A&M University. I woke up, I walked out of my hallway, I turned right, and I saw my roommate standing in front of his TV. I walked in to see what he was watching, and it was the moment right after the first plane had flown into the first tower of the World Trade Center. And the rest of that day, I found myself walking around campus, going into the student center, into the rec center, and all over campus I saw Aggies everywhere having the same exact reaction. Everyone responded with shock and fear. Those were the two responses, shock and fear. In fear, but here's the thing, that wasn't just a Texas A&M thing. That wasn't just us Aggies having a unique response to a tragic moment. No, this is how the world looked on. The world looked on in horror. The world looked on with shock and fear. And it wasn't just isolated to September 11th. Anytime we talk about the Holocaust, we feel the same thing when the When the Boston Marathon bombing happened, we felt the same thing. The attacks in London, in Paris, the shootings in Vegas, and and honestly, you can point to any mass shooting that we've seen come across the news cycle. The response is the same, and it's not just here in this room. It's not just people who are Christians. There are people from different countries in different cultures who respond in the same way. Now, does your worldview make sense of that human experience? Does the lens through which you see life actually make sense of that experience? Let me, let me unpack it this way. If, if you consider yourself a naturalist, I, I'm not talking about being natural and buying organic stuff. That's not what I mean, okay? If you're a naturalist, then you believe that only natural laws and forces are at work in the world. Only the physical world is real. That which can be discerned from observation and experimentation. If you are a naturalist, here's what you have to remember. Um, Technically, we as humans are simply matter in motion. That's what we are. We are matter in motion. We are cosmic stardust, we are accidents, we are bags of biological protoplasm, welcome to church, Jesus loves you, bags of biological protoplasm moving around. According to your worldview, we live in a world that just is. And so the question you need to answer is what objective standard exists in your worldview that allows for you to classify something as evil when stardust bumps into stardust in the form of a mass shooting or a terrorist attack or or rape? What objective exists in your world view that even allows you to classify that as evil? Because again, we live in a world that just is. Listen to what famous atheist Richard Richard Dawkins says in his book, River Out of Edom. This is a long quote, but just follow along. Listen to what he says. He says, the total amount of suffering per year in the natural world is beyond all decent contemplation. 
During the minute that it takes me to compose this sentence, thousands of animals are being eaten alive. Many others are running for their lives, whimpering with fear. Others are slowly being devoured from within by rasping parasites. Thousands of all kinds are dying of starvation, thirst, and disease. It must be so. If there ever is a time of plenty, this very fact will automatically lead to an increase in the population until the natural state of starvation and misery is restored. In a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, other people are going to get lucky, and you won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. Do you hear it? This is a naturalistic worldview. There is no evil, and because there is no evil, there is therefore no good. To, to say that there is a problem of evil in the world, you will also have to say there's a problem of good in this world. The interesting thing is at the heart of naturalism is the evolutionary mechanism of natural selection which depends upon things that we would classify as evil. It depends on death, destruction, and the oppression of the weak to succeed. So a naturalist in some ways has to call these things good for for the world to keep going and succeeding. Here's my point. If you're a naturalist, you will have a hard time classifying things as evil and maintaining intellectual integrity at the same time. You will. Because you're betraying your worldview. You live in a world that just is. There's no objective standard in your worldview. Your worldview doesn't allow for it. So to call something evil is to betray your worldview, and it's not just that, it's to steal from a different worldview. You will steal from the Christian worldview to call something evil. The reason that you will steal from the Christian worldview and classify something as evil is because your worldview has failed to make sense of human experience. Remember, I told you, you have to decide if your worldview actually makes the best sense of human experience. Let me me get off the naturalist, okay? I've harped on it enough, so if that's you in here, just now, my goal isn't to beat you down, it's, it's just to point something out. But let's talk about the postmodernist. And these are the type of people that I work with at a and this is, this is the college student framework right now. But the postmodernist view says that there is no absolute truth and there is no absolute morality. When someone says there is no absolute truth, there is no absolute morality, I just wanna say, is that absolutely true? But you gotta think about it. This idea that what's right for you doesn't have to be right for me and what's right for me might not be right for you, that sounds really sexy when you're talking about things like organized religion or sexuality. But it crumbles when you're talking about devastation. It crumbles when something like 9-11 or the shootings in Vegas happen and the world looks on in horror, shock, and fear. Because in those moments, your worldview doesn't allow for you to look at that and call it evil. At best, all you can do is look at something like 9-11 and say, I personally don't think that was a good idea, but that's just me. Like, I personally am not a fan of mass shootings, but that's just for me. But you can't sit there and say, no, that is objectively wrong. Because your worldview doesn't allow for it. So when you do look at something like 9-11, or any of the mass shootings, or any of the terror attacks, and something in you fires off and says, that is not how things should be. You need to know, in that moment, you are stealing from the Christian worldview. Why? Because your worldview has failed to make sense of your human 
experience. The Christian worldview, on the other hand, provides the necessary preconditions of intelligibility for the problem of evil. It does. God is the necessary precondition that allows us to make intelligible the problem of evil in human experience. He himself is the perfect objective standard of goodness that shines light on that which ought not be. In the Bible's account of creation, God creates and he looks, he looks at what he's created and five or six times it says he saw that it was good. See, God is the one who has established what is good. He has set the standard for us. And he's created us in his image, which means he's created us to be like him. And so when things happen in this world and something inside of us fires off and says, that's not how it should be. That's because we are instinctively appealing to a standard outside of ourselves that's actually been put inside of us by God who is the objective standard of good. We've been created in his image to know what should be. So when things are not as they should be, we're aware of it. You don't have to agree with me. I'm just trying to show you that the Christian worldview does not have to steal from another worldview to make sense of human experience when it comes to evil and suffering. Are evil and suffering arguments for or against the existence of God? I believe that they're arguments for the existence of God. The only reason we're able to know what evil is is because God has established a perfect standard by which we measure that which should be to that which ought not be. Let's move on to the second question. Is evil an argument, or are evil and suffering arguments for or against the goodness of God? Let me explain it this way. In 1998, a movie came out called Patch Adams. It's with, it was with actor Robin Williams, who, who passed away. But uh, Patch Adams was a medical student who was working at a psychiatric hospital and during his time there, he, he fell in love and he got engaged to a fellow medical student. And then one of Patch Adams' patients ended up murdering his fiance. And so Patch Adams finds himself in the movie standing on the edge of a cliff contemplating suicide. And as he contemplates suicide, he begins to talk at God. And here's what he says. It's, it has everything to do with this question we're talking about. He says this, okay, talking to God, let's look at the logic. You create man, man suffers enormous amounts of pain, man dies, maybe you should have had just a few more brainstorming sessions prior to creation. You rested on the seventh day, maybe you should have spent that day on compassion. I wonder if any part of that just kind of says, resonates like, yeah. Like if you've ever been frustrated or angry or bitter at God, I promise you it's because your life has rubbed up against evil or suffering in some way and God didn't do what you think he should do. And so that bitterness or resentment is bred out of a question of God's goodness you have grown to doubt whether God is truly good. And so let's just kind of lean into this question. Are evil and suffering arguments for or against the goodness of God? Well, I think where we need to start is we need to answer the question, does God create evil? Because if God creates evil, we have our answer. That makes God a monster. It does, and so we can rule out goodness from God if he creates evil. But do I think that God creates evil? I believe the answer to that question is no, because I don't think that evil is something to be created. I don't think that evil is something that is sustained on its own. I believe that evil is simply the absence of goodness. 
Evil is, evil is the absence of what should be. It's kind of like cold. Cold doesn't exist on its own. Cold is the absence of heat. What's darkness? Darkness is simply the absence of light. Evil is the same way. It's simply the absence of goodness. When God created the heavens and the earth, he created them good. The existence of goodness then. So if God created things to be good, that necessitates the philosophical probability of evil, the possibility of that which is not good. And I believe that the Bible gives a very good explanation on how that physical, physi- I'm sorry, that philosophical probability became a practical reality. See, when God created the first human beings, he created them with the ability to exercise free will. He specifically created them with the ability to love. He did. God didn't create us to be robots. He created us with the ability to love him. But with that ability to love him came the possibility of rejection. Because if you can't reject somebody, you can't love them. See, love is a choice. Love can't be forced. I didn't handcuff my bride cat and drag her down the aisle like, we're in love, people. There's no love there. That's coercion or manipulation. It's not love. So God in his goodness and kindness created us with the ability to love. But with that came the ability to reject. And Adam and Eve in the garden rejected God. And when they rejected God, evil entered into this world because that is not what should be. What should be is that man and woman are to know their creator and live life with them. They rejected God. That which ought not be entered our world. And with evil entering the world, that philosophical probability became a physical reality. See, evil isn't something that is created. It's, it's, it's the absence of goodness. God created things to be good, which automatically necessitates the probability and the possibility of that which is not good. And that probability has become reality for us. So, Let's step a little further into the question. Are evil and suffering arguments for or against the goodness of God? Well, evil reminds us that God made us with the ability to exercise free will. Look at what I just said. It reminds us, evil actually reminds us that God created us with the ability to love. It does. But with that ability to love comes the ability to Reject, just think. A lot of people say, why, why, if God knew that we were gonna screw up, why didn't he just make us in a way that we wouldn't screw up? That would be better. Would it really be better? Because if God made us with no ability to choose, then that means we would have no ability to love, which means we would have no ability to experience true intimacy in relationship on this earth. Would that really be a better existence? A life with no love and no intimacy? No, God in his kindness and his goodness would never deprive you of that. See, evil actually reminds us of God's goodness displayed in giving us the ability to love. Evil also reminds us of God's patience, wanting none to perish. Follow me on this. God shows us how good he is by not giving us what we think we want. What do we want? We want God to do away with everything that we consider to be evil. We want him to do away with terrorism and uh, mass shootings. We, We want him to do away with the things that we look at and say, that is horrific. But what if God was really going to do something about all of the evil in the world? What if he chose to start in this room? 
What if he chose to start with you and me? Would you be okay with that? See, we believe that evil is something that exists outside of us. That which should not be is all of the stuff that we see on the news that makes us shocked and fearful. But listen to what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through, 12, 10 through 12. He says, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good. Not even one. Do you see what this is saying? This is saying that God looks at all of humanity and you know what he sees when he sees you and me? He sees that which should not be. Because every single one of us in one way or another has rejected God. He has given us the ability to love him or reject him and we have chosen to reject God. God looks at us and doesn't see the solution, he sees the problem. See, humanism says we're the hope of the world. But just look at what's at the root of any act of terrorism, any mass shooting, what's at the root of it? It's gonna either be pride or lust or hate or a need for power. Anyone struggle with pride this week? Anyone thought that they're better than someone else? Anyone struggle with lust? Anyone looked at pornography or just looked lustfully at another person? Anyone struggling with anger, bitterness, and resentment towards someone else? See, what you have to realize is you might deal with your emotions in a more socially acceptable way, but at the root of the things that we find atrocious are at root, have taken root in your life as well. See, we are not the solution. We are the problem. Evil exists in this world because we exist in this world. If you really want to know why God is so good, is because even with us being the problem, he wants us. And he came to rescue us. See, the epitome of evil would be God creating us just to punish us. That would make God a monster, to, to make us just to create us, and instead, I'm sorry, to create us just to punish us. But what does God do? He actually enters into our pain and suffering. God the Father enters into our pain and suffering by crushing his son with his wrath so that he wouldn't do that to us. God the Son, Jesus Christ, enters into our suffering. He deserved to be worshiped as a king and instead he voluntarily got up on a cross and died for all of your sins and all of my sins. Why? So that we wouldn't receive punishment from God, we would receive love from God. Is evil is suffering an argument for or against the existence of God? Well, 2 Peter 3, 9 tells us this, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises, some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. God wants you, God loves you, so he came for you. I believe that evil and suffering actually point us to the goodness of God. The last question is this, are evil and suffering arguments for or against the power of God? So maybe God exists and he's good, which means he cares, but he's just not powerful enough to do anything about the evil in the world. See, it's interesting our tendency when different things happen that we see on the news or when our lives collide with evil and suffering, our tendency is to look at God and say, why don't you do something? But part of me just wonders if God is in heaven with his arms like this, like, I'm always doing something. How do you think you got to church this morning? Just think about how you got here. You got in a machine and traveled somewhere between 40 and 100 miles an hour, depending on who was driving. <laughs> and some of you, we're multitasking. You were arguing with your spouse and illegally looking at your phone while you were surrounded by other machines doing the same thing. So yeah, I'd say God's been doing plenty just in the last hour. I mean, you look at 9-11, 9-11. 
has changed our country for forever. Our country has never been and will never be the same because of that event. But think about the hundreds of thousands of planes that took off and landed safely before 9-11. Think about all the planes that have taken off and landed since 9-11. See, when those planes crash, we say, God, why didn't you do something? When planes land safely, all of us just say, yeah, that's how it should be. God is doing something. You need to know, you know what evil shows us? Evil shows us what man's capable of. Like when you see things on TV, that's showing you what you're capable of. It's showing us what humanity is capable of. This world is full of 7.4 billion sinful and unpredictable people. Let's just be clear, our world is bad. It is not nearly as bad as it could be. Why? Because the grace of God. God also displays his power and his ability to bring beauty from brokenness. God is able to take pain that seems pointless. He's able to make it productive. I, I wish I could just read you a slew of examples. I'll just give one. Catherine Wolf is the author of a book, Hope Heals. I'd encourage you to check it out. But she was a model. And at the age of 26, she had a sudden stroke, which has left her with partial uh, facial paralysis, uh, as well as some deafness and, and issues with, uh, with motor ability. And she told an arena full of 50-something thousand college students, pain isn't the end of your story, it's the beginning of a better story. How's that possible? Because God is powerful enough to bring beauty from brokenness. Here's what I want you to realize, just because you can't see God doing something doesn't mean he's not doing something. Just because you can't see or imagine a good reason why God might allow something to happen doesn't mean that there can't be one. Last, we see God's power over evil in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ really happened, and let me just tell you, you need to know that there is strong, I would say very conclusive, thorough, historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I didn't even say biblical evidence, I said historical evidence. You can prove the resurrection without even opening the Bible. There is strong historical evidence that Jesus walked out of that tomb and now the scriptures would tell us that he ascended into heaven where he's now seated at the right hand of the Father ruling and reigning. If Jesus did walk out of that tomb, then he has conquered sin, death, and evil. And a day is coming where that victory will finally be realized throughout the earth. And John in in Revelation 21 gives a vision of what that will be like for those who know Jesus. It says this, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying crying nor pain anymore for the former things that passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I'm making all things new. Also, he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Jesus is powerful enough to give us what we truly want. This is what we truly want, a life with no pain, no death, no heartache. This is where Jesus is taking those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. I, I can only speak for myself this morning. I'll just tell you this. For me, after extensive examination and consideration, I personally have come to the conclusion that not only does God exist, 
but he cares and he is powerful enough to do something. He has been doing something. He is doing something. And a day is coming where he will do something once and for all with evil and suffering. But that's just me. You have to figure out where you stand. But you need to know if the, if the scriptures are true, and I just, I want you to know, I say this in love for you. If the scriptures are true and you reject a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you need to know that life in this world, which is packed full of evil and suffering, it is by far the closest you will ever get to heaven. And at the same time, if you know Jesus Christ in a personal way, you need to know that life in this world packed full of evil and suffering is by far, without a doubt, hands down, the closest you will ever get to hell. Why? Because Jesus Christ has overcome the grave and he is making all things new. Will you trust him? Because not only does he exist, but he cares and he has the power to do something about it. Let's pray together. I just want to invite all of us to respond right now. Just with eyes closed, would you just listen to my voice real quick? If, if you're here this morning and, and God is just illuminating your heart and in, in your mind to who he is, if, if you would not consider yourself a follower of Jesus Christ, but maybe now you're realizing that you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, that when God sees all humanity, he sees that which should not be. But then if you're realizing that Jesus Christ has stepped out of heaven and into earth in his goodness, he voluntarily went to the cross, he died for your sins, he rose to conquer your sins because he wanted to bring you into a relationship with your heavenly father. If you, that's you this morning, if you want to begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, just with all eyes closed, would you slip your hand up real quick so that I know who I'm talking to in this place this morning? Just keep your hand up for, for just a moment. That's great. So great. If that's you, you can put your hands down. And uh, I just want to invite you in the quietness of your own heart right now just to repeat after me. This isn't a rabbit's foot magical prayer. This is just me helping you tell God what you believe to be true. You just say, Jesus Christ, I invite you into my life this morning. I believe that I'm a sinner and I need a savior. But I believe that in your goodness, you came to earth, you died on a cross for my sins, you rose from the dead to conquer my sins. Would you forgive me for all of my sins? And now begin to lead me in a new way where I learn what it looks like for you to be my forever king. If that's you, if you just prayed that prayer, let me just say welcome to the family of God. The God of the universe looks at you now and calls you his son or his daughter. For the rest of us here, we're going to have time where some of our prayer partners are going to come forward. We're going to respond in worship now, but you just need to know after the service is over, if you need to talk to someone or pray with someone, maybe you're in the midst of suffering right now, and you just need to pray with someone who will just encourage you to keep going and will point you back to hope in Jesus. Make sure that you do that. But let's stand together now. And let's respond to God. Let's worship him as the God that not only exists, but the God who, who loves us, who cares, and is powerful. Our God who is, who is all good and all, all powerful and will one day give us what our hearts truly long for. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day.
Well, hello, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Kyle Pettit, sitting here with Timothy Atik, who just preached a first sermon in uh, the series called Tough Stuff, called Evil in the World. Uh, we have a lot of questions, so we're just going to dive okay. straight into them. Uh, and so the first one has to do with heaven. Um, and it says, heaven is without evil. Earth has evil due to our, our ability to choose, thus reject, but thus know what love is. Can you say a little bit more about life in heaven and why we wouldn't be like robots in heaven? Okay, great question. Mm. Let me just say, I don't know if there's a good thing or bad thing, but apparently we just hit the record on the number of questions that have come into proscripts. I don't know what that means. I'm gonna wear that as a badge of honor. But anyway, <laughs> here's what I want you to know. Uh, these is, this is the stack of questions that have come in, and we don't have time to answer all the questions that have come in. Uh, I would say that not only does this question, but all the questions that have come in, they deserve way more than a 45-minute sermon or a 10-minute podcast right here. Uh, you're not going to like this. I'm, I'm not going to just feed you answers today. What I do want to encourage you to do is to do what I had to do, because we all have to this is a part of not just getting our quick fix and looking on social media to see if we can get a quick answer. I spent, I mean, hours and hours and days and days researching, and I don't say that to overwhelm you. I say it, this stuff will draw you in, and this makes you a more uh, uh, intelligent believer, and this allows you to enter into more intelligent conversations with the, those who don't know the Lord. Let me point you to some resources that were helpful for me. Number one, I would encourage you to go get the book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Frank Turek. Mm -hmm. It is the handbook, in my opinion, on, the, on all topics related. I would go look on YouTube. I would look up articles written by guys and books written by guys like Ravi Zacharias, um, Greg Kokel, Frank Turek, William Lane Craig, uh, these guys are, they're, they're the best out there and they are doing a phenomenal job. Uh, you can also go to a website called gotquestions.org and they have literally answered questions to hundreds of thousands of questions related uh, to spiritual questions. So get out there and do your own research. Don't just settle for, for quick kind of uh, answers. Mm -hmm. to, to speak to the heaven issue, that's a com complex question yeah. that I'm sitting here processing as you ask it. My, what I would say is this, uh, God has given us a promise in Revelation of where He's taking us, mm -hmm. the type of place that He is taking us, where He's taking us to a city, which means it's better than the garden. Mm -hmm. He's not taking us back to the garden, He's taking us to a city, mm -hmm. the New Jerusalem, and He's already promised that it'll be a place with no more pain, no more death, you know, no more tears. Yeah. That says so much to God and His sovereignty that He is good enough to orchestrate a place like that, mm -hmm. okay? Now we can back up and we can say, you know what, uh, if, if we look back from there, if we work our way back, well, we see in the chapter right before He gives us His promise in Revelation 21, he deals once and for all with Satan, mm -hmm. the enemy who started things in the garden when he tempted Adam and Eve. He will be dealt with finally. So this struggle that Ephesians says, says our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and powers and principalities. That struggle is eliminated because God takes away the enemy that the scriptures point to, the father of right. lies gone. So those lies that we've bought into, those aren't a thing mm -hmm. anymore. Temptation, that is not a thing anymore because the tempter has been mm -hmm. done away with. But to even back it up even more, God has given us the choice to love Him or to reject Him. When we step into heaven, it is because God has opened up our eyes and our hearts and we have freely received Him. We've already expressed our love for Him, which means we've already relinquished rejection right. of Him. And when we receive Christ, He puts His Spirit inside of us. And Paul even says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And God is conforming us to the image of His Son, which means more and more this side of heaven, He's, 
He's aligning our desires with his desires, our heart with his heart. He's making us more and more like himself. And then once we die, 1 Corinthians 15 says, Paul says, in a sense, that this physical body, this perishable body will put on the imperishable, this mortal body will put on immortality. That's what Jesus did when he rose from the dead. People didn't first recognize him because he had put on the imperishable. Right. He was not like we are now. And a day is coming when we die where God will make us like Christ is now. Right. That's not him making us a robot. This is taking those who have freely received Christ, conforming them to his image, this side of eternity and and after death, resurrecting us and perfecting us mm -hmm. to walk in the freedom of seeing Jesus face to face and enjoying him forever. That's the best I can do yeah. in a short, like three, four minute answer. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That's helpful. Um, we're going to answer a few more, um, but like TA said, we're not going to get to the full extent of all of this, but yeah. we're going to uh, rattle off a couple others. Um, another question was, you said that God looks at us and sees evil, but wouldn't he see his redeemed children for those that are in fact redeemed? <clears throat> Obviously, this side of glory, we are still being sanctified, but does, it, does he still see evil when he looks at us? Great question. I should have been more clear from the stage. Forgive me for not being clear. I am, when I said that statement, I'm talking about he sees a humanity that does not know Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. I'm not in that equation. And I was saying he sees us. I'm talking about us before beginning a relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to understand that when we know Jesus, the scriptures throughout use this phrase that we are in Christ. Colossians 3 even says we've been hidden in Christ. So if you think about the fact that we are hidden in Christ, when God sees us now, he sees his son. He does. He sees his son. That's the only way that God's able to now pour out his love, acceptance, approval, and favor upon us is because everything that he feels and has for Jesus, he now has for us because we are in Christ. So forgive me for not being clear, but you can walk in the confidence and freedom that when God sees you, he sees his son, mm -hmm. Jesus. That's so good. Cool. Um, well, another one we have. If we are not the ultimate solution to the problem, then how can we be the ultimate problem, as you said? I don't know if I said that we're the ultimate problem, but let's just say that, that we are a huge part of the problem. We, you know, you're either, either Jesus is going to be your king or mm -hmm. Satan and sin are going to be your king. Yeah. So if, if Jesus isn't your king, that means that Satan is ruling in your life, whether you want to acknowledge that or not, means you're on his team. Okay, so you are the, you're a part of the ultimate problem yeah. in the sense that you are being ruled by the, the, the prince of the power of the air. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, you know, evil is in this world because we are in this world. We can try and place the blame on the evil one and say, well, he tempted Adam and Eve. But ultimately, you know what? It, the blame doesn't go to them. God had given Adam and Eve full access to himself. Yeah. He didn't give them a bunch of rules. He gave them one rule. He said, you can eat from any tree. Just don't eat from one. God's will isn't like just this one. It's, hey, I am so good. I'm going to give you the, mm -hmm. the whole garden. And we still believe the lie that God's holding out on us. The responsibility falls to us. That's why I say evil's in this world because we are in this world. But if it, I don't want to play the semantics game, ultimate problem, part of the problem. The bottom line is we, we are on, without knowing Jesus, we are on the team that is the problem. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Yeah, makes sense. Um, another one we have. Uh, where in the Bible does it say that God poured out his wrath on his son? Yeah, I would say that that's wording that I use. Um, the, the closest verse I can get to that, there's not like an exact, I'm not quoting a verse when I say that yeah. God poured out his wrath on his son. But if you look at Isaiah 53, 10, it says, uh, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him mm -hmm. and to cause him to suffer 
another translation says it was the Lord's good plan to crush him. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's really what I'm talking about. You know, there's this super spiritual word that, you know, scriptures even say that Jesus was the propitiation for our sins. He was the satisfaction for our sins. And one of my friends, you might not like this, and I don't even know if I can say this, but uh, he, he defined propitiation. Here's how he explained it to a bunch of high school students. It, he described it as, you deserve a God-sized spanking and Jesus put his butt in the way. That's how he explains propitiation. <laughs> so I would say that propitiation, when it says that Jesus is the propitiation of our sins, that right there is terminology of God pouring out his wrath. Mm -hmm upon our son, uh, not our son, his son, that his wrath was satisfied through Jesus' uh, sacrifice on the cross. Right, cool. Um, another one, how would you answer the postmodernist worldview that says, you do you as long as it doesn't hurt others? Yeah, I've dealt with this, man. Yeah. I've sat with a kid who, you know, for me, when I'm talking about worldview with people and sitting with the postmodernists, like I sat with a guy who's, he's, he's an atheist and, and he's decided, and this goes really well with the postmodernist view, that you can just pick and choose from any worldview and you can just hodgepodge mm -hmm. it all together. So he's got some of the naturalist worldview and some of the humanist worldview and some of the postmodern, mm -hmm. and that's his prerogative. He can do that. But what what I need him to understand is that he is having to borrow from the Christian worldview at some point. Mm -hmm. He is. With a guy like this who says, you do you as long as you're not hurting anyone, I would just say, you know, it's a slippery slope because they can always, where this guy that I talked to at A&M who said, hey, look, I don't have any evidence for my worldview. It's just the worldview I've chosen to hold. And I'm mm. like, okay, thanks yeah. for being honest. Yeah. But mine is coming from a very supported, well-evidenced position. That is a dangerous place to be to say, I am doing this because it feels right to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just because that is what's true for you does not mean that other things aren't true. Yeah. Like your feeling doesn't trump reality. Yeah. So with a guy like that, though, ultimately I'd say, well, okay, let's talk about uh, pride in your life. Okay. When's the last time pride was expressed in your life? Because pride hurts people. Mm -hmm. Have you hurt anyone today? Lust. Okay. When was the last time you've taken advantage of someone either mentally or in reality because of lust? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about greed. Have you been selfish? Uh, I could argue that your greed and your selfishness has means that other people haven't been impacted by your life because of your greed. Uh, power, your need for power, okay? Yeah. Yeah. And I would just say, you doing you isn't working for you, mm -hmm. okay? Because you are, your, your life is hurting other people. My life hurts other people because I'm an imperfect person. Mm -hmm. But I can, my worldview calls that sin. Yeah. And that I'm in need of a savior. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, yeah, it does. That so, idea that it's not ever just truly you. Yeah. Our consequences, our actions always brought into other That's people. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, well, I believe our last one, uh, not our last one that we have, but the last one we're going to do, because we have, like TA showed, a stack of questions. Um, is this, do you think, um, we'll start from the beginning, uh, you seem to argue that naturalists are stealing from, a, uh, from Christianity if they believe in evil. Do you think it's not possible to believe in the natural evil? In other words, is it possible that humanity, humanity collectively over thousands of years arrived at a general consistence, uh, consensus of what is evil and what is good? Wouldn't it better explain why something like slavery was acceptable until very recently? That, that is what naturalists would say. Mm -hmm. When I sat at lunch with a guy who's an atheist, that, it is 
it's kind of social evolution that we as a society have evolved to a place where we have in a sense determined what is right and what's right. wrong and i understand that rationale mm -hmm. my my issue with it and and i understand that a naturalist will hear this and have an answer for it mm -hmm. i'm not debating that but at the heart of naturalism is we are matter in motion okay we things going in my mind it's just chemicals firing mm -hmm. that's it so if if chemicals firing tell me to kill someone i didn't have the choice whether or not to do that that's just what chemicals firing matter in motion you know stardust right that was just stardust bumping into stardust right so you have no right to look at me and say you shouldn't have done that because all I could say is that's what chemicals firing led me to do. Yeah. And I have no right to say you should or shouldn't do X because chemicals might be firing mm -hmm. different in you and leading you to do something mm -hmm. else. But in the end, we are just matter in motion. It's, it's, we can only deal with the physical yeah. here, the physical realm, what is observable and what we can figure out through experimentation and so that's a dangerous slope to begin to to bring in the 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 side of to bring in the unseen to bring in right. things that really lean towards the soul mm -hmm. when you get into right or wrong right. because ultimately your understanding of right and wrong will just all the best you can lean on is that chemicals firing have have led you to that but yeah. if someone else doesn't get there then you know it, and that rabbit hole goes deeper that you know you can separate you know different kinds of evolution mm -hmm. and so I can't get into that here on this but that's how I would respond in a really short answer that I'm sure someone will find problems with <laughs> right uh, well awesome thank you um, and obviously we have we are out of time already to, to go through this. So could you tell us again those resources um, and where we're going next week? Yeah, this might be the longest postscripts in history <laughs> now. So we'll, this is just a record-setting day. But um, let me just say first, I actually did a series at Breakaway, and the series uh, was entitled What's Up With? And we covered things like science. We covered the uh, validity of the Bible the problem of evil in the hypocrisy of Christians, which actually was a talk about the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so if that would be a helpful resource for you, I would check that out. You need to know that a bunch of studying went into that. Resources, again, for you to hit. Probably the most helpful resource that I've come across personally for myself is the book I mentioned at the beginning, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist by Frank Turk. He has done a great job of putting it in language that is very easy to understand. Beyond that, seriously, spend some time uh, looking at YouTube and reading articles from guys like Ravi Zacharias. Go watch him on YouTube. He is brilliant. Mm -hmm. And guys like Greg Kokel, Frank Turk, William Lane Craig, these guys are doing a fantastic job giving intelligent answers for life's most pressing questions. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you, T.A. Uh, thanks for answering. Thanks for preaching. And thank you for joining us at Postscript. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org postscript.